Welcome everyone to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abitronistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security oriented policies to guide the state of Israel. We are a movement of more than 20,000 people here in Israel, including many reserve officers and operators from all branches of the Israel Defense establishment. Thank you so much to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning in to these briefings. We have a lot to share with you today and the rest of the week. It's a great privilege to be joined once again today by Yifa Segel, who is the Managing Director of Chetz for Israel, a nonprofit that connects world leaders, policymakers, opinion leaders, and change makers to influence the world for good and to advance Israel's national security. She's a research fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for St Strategy and Security and head of the Siegel Lee Law and, Str and Strategy, formerly the Chief of Staff for Israel's Ambassador to the U.S., and founder and former CEO of the International Legal Forum, a proactive legal hub for lawyers, organizations, and activists from all over the world fighting against terror, anti-Semitism, and the delegitimization of Israel and the Jewish people. Yafa, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Marcus. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And also, I forgot to mention, and you're a, a, an important member of IDSF. Can't leave right. that out. Yeah. yeah, you should have started with that. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so let's start with uh, something that everyone is talking about, which is the International Criminal Court, the proceedings in Israel's defense in the ICJ. What can you share with us about the whole thing? The small question. Um, so first of all, you said International Criminal Court. I just want to, you know, I just want to emphasize that there are two courts in The Hague. Uh, one is the International Criminal Court, which is the ICC, which is a different issue. I mean, we've been dealing, Israel has been dealing with, with that problem for a few years. Uh, this time we have a new problem. It's the ICJ, it's the International uh, Court of Justice. And so this is a place where countries come uh, to, uh, with an issue, with a, with a bilateral problem, uh, whether it's a treaty that was violated or was a, a duty under international law that was violated and they come to deliberate in front of, of this court. And so this, this, this goes to explain why we, you know, they had, there, there has to be a country like South Africa in this case that would bring a, a claim against Israel and they brought it under the um, ridiculous allegation that Israel is violating the, uh, uh, you know, the treaty against genocide. And uh, and this is we're basically standing trial there for for that absurd uh, um, allegation. And so, you know, there's a lot to say about that. I'll just, you know, give you the headlines and then you tell me if you want more information about something. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is most people don't know because South Africa has, a, you know, this uh, beautiful romantic story from the past that it fought and, and defeated the regime of apartheid that they had. And so this is kind of an aura that stayed with the uh, with the country for many years in the minds of many people. the 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 problem is is that it's it's not the case in South South Africa not at all for many years. South Africa unfortunately has become a very corrupt state. They are in bed with all the bad actors that you can think of, right? Starting from uh, you know uh, Iran to Hamas to Hezbollah or ISIS even, and they're a hub for money laundering and corruption and even violence, uh, domestic violence uh, um, um, against their own people. And so it's, it was no surprise for, for people who are dealing with the international stage or, or uh, you know, with international bad actors uh, to learn that South Africa, with, given their relationship with Iran and with Hamas and the other players, uh, bad actors, that they've decided to kind of help the war against Israel in, in, with other means, like to take it to the diplomatic stage or to the uh, judicial stage and, uh, and, and, and try to force us into submission with uh, a decision by the ICJ whether to stop the war or to, de to denounce Israel as, 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 as a state committing genocide. And that's the goal. At least get us into trouble, get us to second guess ourselves, get us to spend a lot of attention and a lot of energy, which is exactly what we have been doing. And instead of focusing on, on our survival and, 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 and to fence off the, the, the threats to our existence coming from the Iranian proxies that surround us. And, uh, and so that's the purpose. I also want to say that, uh, unfortunately, much like all the other international organizations, you see 
that it's politically driven. It's not a court of law. It's not a place where justice, you can find justice. It's a place where politics leads the way and the narrative and the agenda. And so just by looking at the list of countries who are who has judges who are presiding over this uh, proceedings, you can already you know, kind of guess what the re end result will be even before the liberations even started, right? So uh, we know this, and this is a, a, a risk for us. It's, uh, it's definitely, as I said, time consuming energy and focus. Um, but uh, we understand the, the, the situation and uh, I think Israel is doing a good job. I mean, with the, they've sent an amazing team. I don't know if you guys have listened to the, you know, to the arguments Friday from the Israeli team. And uh, also there was a press conference with the uh, families of the hostages, the Israeli hostages. And uh, of course their message is in incredibly important on the international stage. And uh, we also saw some uh, progress in the, uh, in a sense of countries standing up and, and defending Israel or defending the uh, misinterpretation and distortion of international laws. Countries like Germany, even a statement from Canada we heard uh, the other day. Um, so I guess that kind of, you know, in a very general way uh, to start off the conversation. <laughs> sure, so tell me, you, you said the word risk, that there's a risk that Israel has by participating. What, what ramifications, what implications could there be if there's a decision that's negative towards Israel? So that's a good question. I mean, so first of all, it's important to know that uh, this court, like all the other international uh, institutions, it doesn't really have its own whip there is no uh, ICJ police or or they don't have an independent uh, ability to sanction a country or or anything of that nature. So, I mean, uh, if you if you just look at the history of the ICJ and its uh, decisions, you'll see a lot of countries that defied and completely ignored uh, whatever decision was made against them. Uh, that includes bad actors, but also very positive actors like uh, Western countries as well. Um, so it, it's it, we will not if we decide to say you know we don't care about what you ha what, about your decision we're just going to ignore it we're not going to be the first country to do that not at all so that's important to know however once you have a decision like that by an institution that is unfortunately still considered uh, prestigious and uh, you know a lot of people walk around the world still think that there's justice in the international system uh, even though that's not the case. So we might be facing uh, bilateral problems with uh, with different countries around the world. Um, you know, countries might say we don't want to do business with Israel now, or we don't want to sell weapons, or buy weapons, or technology, or uh, there might be, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this might reach the uh, uh, Security Council. Maybe the Americans would be less comfortable, uh, or it's going to be less easy for them to veto whatever, uh, you know, bad. Uh, um, so decision is, is, is out for vote. So, I mean, there might be problems on, on different, you know, uh, this might open the door for problems, but it's not going to be directly from the, from the ICJ. So, you know, we should take it seriously, but it's, it shouldn't, uh, I, I see a lot of Israelis freaking out about this. We should not freak out. It's not the first time that we have to, you know, handle a very biased international, um, you know, set of circumstances against us. So we'll deal with this one. And do you think there would be an issue of South Africans in Israel going back home, let's say they served in the IDF, having problems in South Africa? Yeah, I heard, uh, I, I heard that the South Africans are planning to cause problems. But, uh, I, you know, honestly, I hear more of, of, of South Africans that are just fleeing the country because of, of the, you know, the, the, the level of violence and corruption and uh, you know their economy going down the drains, and uh, you know the it, it's just a, it it becomes a very it became unfortunately a very scary place, and it seems like it's it's only going to get worse. So you know I don't see many Israelis uh, you know that now live here and will say you know we want to go back to South Africa. I mean not not in the foreseeable future, not before they kind of return to being a functioning uh, free state. Um, and that goes not just for Jews or for for Israelis. Uh, there's uh, you know a lot of good people are fleeing South Africa in recent years, and uh, and I, I think it's very detrimental for South Africa. But that's the reality that was created there, unfortunately. Now, to what extent do you think Israel can take Hamas or the PA 
or even UNRWA to some of these international bodies of law? Is there such a possibility? Look, again, I mean, I would not choose a venue that is uh, that I know is inherently biased against me, right? I, I, I will not choose to try to, you know, to, to get a, you know, a, a, any honest, objective ruling from an Iranian judge or a Pakistani judge or even a Moroccan judge or, you know, a Chinese and et cetera, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think any delusion that Israelis have about the international institutions, we should completely, totally wake up from it. Uh, I saw, by the way, that uh, Israelis invited the, the families of, of the hostages invited the prosecutor from the ICC to come visit Israel uh, a few weeks ago. I wrote an article about that. And, uh, you know, you know, it's 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 just unfortunately, people don't understand who they're dealing with. Right. I mean, like they thought he would come here and he would see their loved ones, uh, elderly children, babies, women are raped and then people are kidnapped and, and massacred. And, you know, the whole story of October 7 is so atrocious that it speaks for itself. And they thought this would, you know, if, if any normal person comes in and just, you know, be exposed to this information, it, they would automatically be on their side. That's not what happened, even though the uh, Israeli media was so optimistic about it, which I also thought was ridiculous. Uh, but, you know, if you go on the website of the ICC or if you see the press release or, or the reporting from um, AP or Reuters and, and you see what they actually said. So it, it, it's not really we understand Israelis were victims. It's more like you know, moral equivalent, and both parties must abide by international law, and there are victims on both sides, and there are brave people on both sides, and uh, Israel must abide by international law, and, and different statements like that, including a few words about, you know, the, the horrific stories of, of, of the Israelis that they've encountered uh, while visiting Israel. So that's the reality about the international stage. So to answer your question, that's not where I would go to try to find uh, justice in this world for, for Jews. Okay, so I mean, it's it has been just devastating to put out into the world all of the tra tragedies here in Israel, and the international community is silent on it. And you're telling me that the international courts is not a place to go. So what is the avenue outside of the borders of Israel? Is there a legal mechanism? Is there a trade option? Anything that can be done to make things better? So first of all, I think that... Uh... You know, we we have a, a wonderful system that uh, we can put into a very good use. And uh, I don't know why we would even, you know, look for anything outside our own system. So, you know, the terrorists that were captured and will be trialed, uh, you know, the terrorists from October 7th or from the terrorist attacks that came afterwards will be trialed in the Israeli system. Justice can be found for the victims in the Israeli system. So, you know, that's that's one thing and that's good enough. I don't want to put these uh, Hamas terrorists on an airplane to The Hague and hope that maybe they will, you know, make a decision about uh, um, their their guilt in, in, in the, the massacre and the rape and the torture and the kidnapping. Um, we have a system. And uh, as for, uh, you know, organizations like UNRWA, it's our own doing. OK, so. Hopefully, when once we take over uh, the Gaza Strip and once we get rid of Hamas as a, the, the ruling uh, party in, in the Gaza Strip, then, you know, hopefully we can start putting a better system in place. And, 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 and as a part of that solution, we should get rid of all these, uh, you know, negative actors that come in and, 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 and their sole purpose is to perpetrate uh, the conflict and, 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 and to cultivate this narrative of, of uh, Palestinian self-identity that is wrapped solely around the destruction of Israel. Um, so once you get rid of all these, uh, you know, very, very negative um, actors and, 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 and you just put in some positive ones or at least uh, objective ones, uh, par, right? Um, then maybe you have a hope for a better future, but it's, it's, it's in our hands, at least in Gaza after we get rid of Hamas, you know, we can do we can we can literally press the restart button hopefully, and, and try to build a, a better system there. There was a discussion in the Knesset last week about uh, the extent to which UNRWA is connected to terrorist activity and the future of UNRWA. Can you just explain to us what needs to happen in order to stop UNRWA from reestablishing re in Gaza? So, look, um, UNRWA is unique 
in a sense that it was created as a as a as an agency for the Palestinian refugees and only for Palestinian refugees. So if you look at the world and at any given moment, you have hundreds of conflicts, including violent conflicts that are happening. And there are people who are in need of, of humanitarian aid, whether it's because there is a war or there is a political coup or there is a natural disaster. And yet there are entities, whether it's international or national entities that go around the world and provide humanitarian help, uh, aid and assistance to all of these different people. So, for example, for refugees, you have the UNHCR, which is the general uh, agency for refugees, for all refugees in the world, but Palestinian refugees. And, and their uh, mandate is to help you resettle. If you are a refugee, then their job is as soon as possible to get you to resettle and, 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 and provide you with the, the, the help that you need to, to restart your life. And UNRWA is the one and only agency whose role it is to, to make sure that there are more and more and more and more refugees forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay, so it's not like that if you say we're not allowing UNRWA into the Gaza Strip, then you will deprive, you know, the Gazans from getting humanitarian aid. That's not the case at all. Just choose the right agencies and the right institutions to come into Gaza, that their purpose is to actually help people, you know, rebuild their lives and not perpetuate the you know this hateful narrative and 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 the idea that you need to be a refugee forever and the number of refugees need to keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying so um so as i said like it's in our hands i'm not saying it's it's going to be easy probably going to have a few uh, diplomatic uh, challenges on 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 our way to you know to make sure that that happens but if we don't understand how important it is and if we don't decide that this is something that we're not going to compromise on, then it's not going to happen. One of the very important things that IDSF does here in Israel, if as you know, is we work with the foreign diplomats stationed in Israel. And we have coming up a uh, closed door briefing for international diplomats from 40 countries. They are coming together um, and you, along with a number of other uh, important people, are going to brief them. Are you able to share with us? I know you can't share everything, and certainly that whole briefing is is closed to the press. It's not public, so to speak. Can you share some of the headlines, what you're going to tell this international diplomat community? Yeah. So first of all, I'll tell you that uh, you know we we set uh, together and and try to come up with a, a plan, or at least um, you know the general principles for a plan that can be uh, applied in Gaza. You know, for the first time maybe ever, we want to try to create a, you know, a, um, a trajectory where there's actually a, a positive future, um, you know, for Gaza, for Gaza, Israel, um, you know, for the entire region, maybe, hopefully. So in order to do that, you can continue to do more of the same and hope for different results. That, I think, is the definition of insanity. So, you know, we first first thing that we did was kind of, you know, uh, study uh, precedents in history and see how and when uh, countries were able to win wars against, you know, uh, death cults, you know, crazy ideological um, groups and actually, uh, you know, completely change the society into a positive direction. And, and, and in the course of history, I think we can only find two examples for that. And that is uh, in Nazi Germany, when the Allies conquered Nazi Germany, and a similar mechanism that was applied in, in, Fran in uh, Japan. And so what was different about, you know, the Allied uh, um, uh, plan in, in, in Germany, for example, than what they try to do in Afghanistan or what we try to do with the Palestinian Authority or, or with Hamas? So first of all, it, it was clear to them that winning uh, this war uh, on the military level is not enough. You have to kill the ideology. You have to kill the idea. You have to completely change course. So first of all, of course, making sure that you actually are victorious militarily and that you gain military control uh, throughout the time that is needed to, to implement the plan. So of course, the first pillar of our, of our idea is to make sure, again, security, that Israel maintains uh, control over the territory, including the Philadelphia corridor and, 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 and a full presence and ability to move freely around the Gaza Strip for the foreseeable future. Second is, is what the Allies did in a, in a process of denazification, as they call it. So they said, we have to uproot the hatred, the, you know, the narrative 
Otherwise, we're going to have a new Adolf Hitler in a year or 10 or 20 or 30. It's not going to end. You know, Nazi ideology is there in the hearts and minds of people. So we have to change the indoctrination. So change the textbooks, change the curriculum, change the, you know, the, the, the people who are preaching in the mosques or, or uh, on, the, on media, with social media or classic media. Everywhere that you have a, a, you know, influence over society and the indoctrination process, you have to change the people that are responsible for that. And also, again, understand that it's a completely, uh, um, it's not a short-term plan. It's, it's a plan for like a generation, maybe. So denazification is, is number two. Number three is divide the territory and not, you know, not, not put, don't just put one entity that will control the whole thing again. Because took take for example the Palestinian Authority, right? Israel thought, or some people in Israel thought that uh, Yasser Arafat has, uh, you know, seen the light, and he's now, you know, b became this cute teddy bear that just wants peace. Uh, turns out that's not true. But then you're stuck with him. He's just one leader who's corrupt and and uh, and uh, advancing terrorism, and there's nothing that you can do about it. But if you divide it into four parts or five parts. Then you have, uh, you know, something that you can actually control. If if someone is going rogue, or if uh, you know, is, it turns out to be a terrorist, then you can easy, more easily re uh, deal with that problem. Whether it's replacing them, or putting pressure on them, or condition international aid with, you know, their uh, staying in line. Let's say. So dividing it, choosing Palestinian leaders that are not from within the known factions who are all part of the death cult. Um, so people who are business people or people who are, um, you know, looking for better future for their own people, who have financial prosperity, cooperation, uh, with, with Israel, with the West, with the Sunni world in the Gulf states. Um, and then you create a, uh, uh, an entity, an international entity that is meant to supervise and condition international aid and, and, and support in the rebuilding of Gaza. Uh, condition it on on them complying with benchmarks that are prepared, right? Like fighting terrorism, changing curriculums, uh, you know, the denazification process, uh, enhanced cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. And then the 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 these entities, these new administrations that cooperate more will get more. And if you don't cooperate at all, then you don't get anything. And uh, and and this is how, if you look at it long term, hopefully, maybe. You know, you can have, uh, you know, the next generation of Palestinians have a different concept of what their identity is and that it's something that doesn't just revolve around the death and destruction of Jews. It sounds like a beautiful idea. I certainly hope it works. The problem of this ideology, I don't think, is limited to Hamas in Gaza. It's the Houthis in Yemen. It's Hezbollah. It's a majority of the, the Arabs in, the, in Judea and Samaria. It's Iran. So as Israel over the next generation potentially would be trying to re-educate the Gazans, how do we compete against the money coming out of Qatar and all of these other bad actors? So I, I think you're right. Absolutely. I mean, the question is who's paying for everything, right? I mean, if if Iran is paying for everything and, and Qatar is paying, you know, for a curriculum in the uh, universities in the United States and, and, and look at, at, at the type of students that came out of these institutions in, in recent years. I mean, that's exactly right. So if you are the one who is controlling, uh, you know, the money coming into the Gaza Strip and you are the one who is controlling what kind of education these people will get and their exposure instead of to you know, Iranian uh, ideas and, and the Iranian proxies, they will be more exposed to, you know, forward thinking, um, you know, uh, UAE, for example, or even Saudi Arabia or Egypt, then, you know, they have someone to look up to. I mean, you, you, you see the, uh, you know, the Emiratis as, 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 as kind of the new Arabs. You see a, a lot of young people around the Arab world looking at the Emiratis and, and saying, oh, my God, look at these Arabs. I mean, they're well respected in the world. They're wealthy. They're educated. They're sophisticated. This is this is what they want to be. It's a it's a, it's a, it's something to look up to. So if you make this more accessible for uh, for 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 young Arabs in in the Gaza Strip or in Judea and Samaria or in Syria or in Lebanon or wherever, then you know you have a chance of actually setting a different course for 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 the next generation of of, of Palestinians, for example. I certainly hope you're right. I really do.
and um, a lot is riding on it, obviously. I want to thank all of our viewers for sending in so many questions. There are, there are too many to get to, as usual. Um, but I guess just one, a lot of people seem to be writing a very similar question that you're talking about changing the ideology of an entire culture, entire religion. Do you see it that way? And do you see that as something that's possible? Look, I think that if you go to um, uh, Americans around your age and ask them, if, uh, if they would have dreamt 30 years ago or 20 years ago that they would have children that would support Osama bin Laden and, 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 and support Al-Qaeda and will go and spread the, you know, the bin Laden letter and say he was right and this is life changing for them. And then they would go and, and, and try to, you know, to completely and, and do what they are doing now with anti-Semitism and, and, you know, this whole movement is going on, on on college campuses. I mean, you would say this is completely impossible and, and I'm completely insane. And yet, you know, with a lot of effort and a lot of money and a lot of thinking, a lot of strategizing, within a couple of decades, you know, they the, the Qataris were able to transform a lot of American society. Okay? So, and also, if you had spoken to people in, I don't know, in 1942 in Germany, and you and you would say within a few years you will become you know the the leaders of coexistence in Europe. You would be the you know the pioneers of the unite of, of of the EU, of cooperation and human rights and 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 all that. In 1942, they would have told you you're crazy. Or if you would have sp spoken to Japanese in 1942 and say you know you you know you guys for decades would choose not to have an army at all. This this would be your choice to not have an army because of of of, of you know, your desire to take back everything that you have done with the Imperial Japan. Everyone would tell you you're crazy, but it took effort. It took a vision. It took, you know, there were a lot of hurdles and a lot of trouble and a lot of, you know, hardships to overcome. But, you know, all of these examples are, are things that you can learn from. And so I think that if we don't try, we will never succeed. That's, that's my point. We have to try. Yifa, thank you so much. You are grounded in reality and you have a lot of optimism, which is wonderful to hear. So thank you so much for joining. For all of our viewers, again, thank you for joining as well. Tomorrow we will be back 10 a.m. Eastern time with Brigadier General Amir Avivi. He will join us tomorrow. He had a very important meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu at the end of last week. And uh, we're anticipating tomorrow to share that with you all. So please make sure to tune back in tomorrow. Until then, be safe, stay strong, take care, everyone. Thank you, Moshe. Bye, everybody.